Hello everybody, and welcome to class number 22 of Physics 218. Last time, we were talking about some statistics ideas that are going to be useful in our study of quantum mechanics. Uh, so we talked about expectation values, which is a fancy way of, of saying average values. Uh, and we talked about uncertainty, uh, and how uh, to think about that. Uh, it's a fancy way of saying standard deviation. Uh, we saw how to calculate and think about uh, so uh, the expectation value of x and the uncertainty uh, delta x, and hopefully you've had the chance to work through uh, that extended example where you were calculating a whole bunch of things about a particular uh, somewhat artificial wave function. So we've been looking at uh, these sort of rather artificial solutions to the Schrodinger equation, or wave function so far, uh, and what we'll start doing today is looking to uh, actual solutions of the Schrodinger equation. Uh, I'll spend a minute recapping it. Uh, we'll then talk about solutions to the Schrodinger equation for a free particle that isn't interacting with anything else. Then we'll talk about wave packets, so combining uh, plane wave solutions to build up something that's localized. And this will lead us into an introduction to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, uh, which uh, we'll continue discussing next time. Now, when discussing the Schrodinger equation, uh, here's what we have to think about. The system under consideration consists of a particle of mass m, and possibly other things it's interacting with. So, other Uh, and we assume that these other interactions with other things in the system give rise to uh, a potential energy. Uh, and I'm going to follow Townsend's notation and uh, denote uh, potential energy V of x. Uh, this is pretty common in quantum uh, mechanics. Uh, we just uh, have to remember that V is not voltage here, uh, but hopefully the, the context makes things clear. So this is like if we were thinking about, let's say, you know, throwing a ball or something, like my marker, and right, if I can think about, uh, so like the gravitational interaction um, that's going on between the Earth and my marker, if I define a system, consisting of my marker and the Earth. I can sort of ignore the Earth explicitly and just think about my marker interacting with a potential energy, you know, the gravitational uh, potential energy. Um, and that's basically what we do in the Schrodinger equation. Uh, in chapter 3 we'll start looking at uh, some explicit examples of potential energies for which we can solve the Schrodinger equation. Uh, but just as a reminder, here's what the uh, Schrodinger equation says. So it says that, right, minus h bar squared over 2m times my second derivative of my wave function with respect to position uh, plus V, which we assume to depend on position, um, uh, times psi. Uh, and that we assume uh, that we take to be equal to ih bar times partial psi partial t. Now, again, as I said a couple of classes ago, I haven't tried to justify this. Ultimately, the justification comes from agreement with experiment. Historically, that would be for the hydrogen atom. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll see later today how this, at least for a free particle, is at least consistent 
with previous ideas we've talked about. Okay. Uh, oh, and let me just remind everyone, just because this is, I think, fairly new to us, the h-bar here, this simply means Planck's constant h divided by 2 pi. Okay, so let's first, let's think about solutions. So, simplest case. So, V, so the simplest case is where the potential energy V of x is zero, where there's no interaction with anything giving rise to a potential energy. Not surprisingly, we call this case the free particle. Now, if v of x equals zero, right, this term here goes away, and the Schrodinger equation reduces to uh, minus h bar squared over 2m <coughs> d squared psi dx squared equals i h bar partial psi partial t. Now, here's what I claim. I'm going to claim that a solution to this is the following. That psi of xt equals a, so some constant a, e to the i hey x minus omega t is a solution. If it's true that h bar squared k squared over 2m equals uh, h bar omega. Okay. So thus far, where a is a constant, we're assuming k and omega are just constants for now. But as we'll see uh, going forward here, we'll be able to assign some uh, meaning, some physical interpretation to both k and omega. But for the purposes of, of, of showing that this claim to be true, we just think of them as constants. Now, uh, I think uh, because I, I, I can't directly be talking to you right now, I'm going to take the next couple of minutes to show that this is in fact a solution uh, to this equation. If you don't uh, want to go through the details, uh, feel free to skip the next couple of minutes of the video. Uh, so on the homework for uh, 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 at some point, I'll be asking you to uh, show that uh, a plane sine or a cosine is not a solution. So you can kind of see how, how, how the game is played. Okay, so here we are, again, we're trying to uh, look at the free particle Schrodinger equation, uh, and we're going to try to show that uh, under some uh, assumptions, this wave function here solves this differential, uh, this partial differential equation. As we frequently do in physics, we have shown that it's a solution by uh, substituting this into both sides, uh, and then seeing if we do in fact get an equality. So this is going to be an ex exercise in calculating some deriv derivatives. Uh, so let's just start in on it. Okay, we need the second derivative of the wave function with respect to position. So let's start by just calculating uh, partial psi, partial x. Now, Right, a is a constant, uh, if we're, since we're taking the partial derivative with respect to position, e to the minus i omega t here, which is just multiplying this, remember that when you multiply uh, exponentials, the exponents add. So that's all sort of a constant. The only bit that depends on x is e to the i kx. And if you take the derivative of that, right, well, we, we have to, the, the derivative of e to the x is 
e to the x, but we have to remember to use the chain rule. So when we do that, what, we, what happens is that we pull down a factor of i k, so we get i times k times all the other stuff, all those constants, so we have our e to a e to the i k x minus uh, omega t, so the, the a and the e to the minus i omega t were all constants. We got this piece from differentiating an exponential, and then here from the chain rule. So if we do this again to take the second derivative, a partial derivative with respect to x, the same thing happens, right? Now uh, we're just going to pull down another factor of i k, and we're going to be multiplying all of this. So we get i k squared a e to the i kx minus omega t. Now we can simplify this, right, because i squared is equal to negative 1. So this turns into minus k squared a e to the i kx minus omega t. And then plugging this in to the left-hand side of our free particle Schrodinger equation, we get that the left-hand side is minus h bar squared over 2m times the second derivative. We have a minus sign here and a minus sign that, uh, there, so we end up with plus h bar squared k squared over 2m times a e to the i kx minus omega t. We can play the same. Uh, we can play the same game with the right hand side. So if we take the partial derivative of psi with respect to time, right? Again, a is a constant. Right, we're differentiating with respect to t, holding x constant. So a e to the i k x is a constant. So we have a e to the i k x. The time dependence comes from e to the minus i omega t. Uh, but again, using the chain rule, we end up with a minus i omega. Uh, and then I can combine all of this to be minus i omega a e to the i kx minus omega t. Now, uh, we if we look at the right-hand side of the Schrodinger equation, we need to multiply this derivative by i h bar. But remember that i times minus i is minus i squared, or minus minus 1, or plus 1. So the right-hand side is in fact equal to h bar so I'll write, let me write that out explicitly. Uh, we have i, i times minus i h bar omega a the i k x minus omega t. Uh, and simplifying the i's, we have h bar omega a e to the i k x minus omega t. So let's compare the left-hand side and the right-hand side. Notice that we have the same factor of our wave function, right? The same a e to the i kx minus omega t on both sides. What is needed for the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side? So LHS equals RHS if uh, we have h bar squared k squared over 2m equals h bar omega, and that's exactly what I claimed. So uh, I'll erase the board, and then we'll start to look at what the, uh, the physical meaning of this solution is, and what this relationship tells us. Okay. So the question we now have to ask is, 
what is the, what are the physical properties of this solution to the Schrodinger equation for a free particle? Well, hopefully this looks familiar because this is none other than the complex representation of a plane wave. This is a plane wave uh, and it's traveling to the right. It's a plane wave. It has a definite wavelength. Right, so here's where we start to layer on some physics. The wavelength, as you will remember probably from 217, and I think we practiced with it earlier, right, the, lo the wavelength lambda uh, is 2 pi over k, which we'll now physically interpret as our wave number. Right? Uh, and so by uh, de Broglie, Remember that de Broglie tells us that, uh, that there's a correspondence between wavelength and momentum, right? So de Broglie tells us that wavelength is equal to uh, h, Planck's constant, over the magnitude of momentum, p, right? And so if we put these two ideas uh, together, right? What we find is that p, right, of solving this for p, we have p equals h over the wavelength, lambda, but plugging that in, so 1 over lambda, that's h times k over 2 pi, but h over 2 pi is just h bar. And so this leads us to the uh, important relationship that P equals h bar k for uh, this solution to the Schrodinger equation. So we've seen that this plane wave solution to the Schrodinger equation represents something that has some definite momentum. However, there's something weird about this wave function. However, this wave function is not normalizable. Let's let, let's see why. Because psi of x t modulus squared, right, it's going to be psi star psi. Right? So if we assume A could be complex, that's going to be A star e to the minus i k x minus omega t times A k x minus omega t. Notice the uh, two exponentials multiply together to 1, and so we get a star a, or uh, a modulus squared. But assuming a is a constant, right, since this is a plane wave, the integral of a constant over all of space, right, psi... minus infinity. So that's just the integral of a constant this integral can't possibly be equal to 1. This is a constant multiplying infinity. Okay. 
So, that doesn't make sense. We're forced to conclude that this wave function can't represent a particle in the usual way we would think about it. It turns out that uh, this kind of wave function, right, so, it's, so it's not a particle, uh, but it turns out, uh, and we'll say more later on, that this does represent Uh, a long sort of uh, continuous going on forever, a beam of particles. And these plane wave states are actually really convenient uh, as long as we don't require them to represent a single uh, isolated particle. Okay, so what we're going to do next is we're going to take this idea here. Uh, and we're going to have you think about a clicker question. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to think about the clicker question, Here's what uh, we want to remember. So remember that, uh, so from this relationship here, bigger P is associated with bigger K, or you can think about it as bigger P is a shorter wavelength. Uh, and so it's the, so that leads us to the uh, ranking of my uh, momenta. So we've got, uh, so, uh, so I asked you to do smallest uh, first, so we have A equals D, uh, and then uh, which is less than B, which is less than C. Okay, welcome back. So uh, I, there's one more piece of physics I, I want to examine. Um, so what is the significance of the thing that we required earlier, right? We said that that plane wave was a solution to the free particle Schrodinger equation if we required h bar squared k squared over 2m to be equal to h bar omega. Let's massage this side a little bit. Since we know that p equals h bar k, right? this turns into over 2m turns into p squared over 2m. Now, this might look a little funny, but it's actually classical kinetic energy. Uh, and now, uh, why is that, right? So you, we know that uh, non-relativistic uh, kinetic energy is one half m v squared, uh, but we can write the magnitude of momentum in terms of uh, p equals m v again non-relativistically, right? So one half m v squared is 1 over 2m times m v quantity squared, which is just p squared over 2m. So this is kinetic energy, and if, we're, if, if this is supposedly describing a free particle that's not interacting with energy, anything, but not interacting with energy, anything, and therefore has no uh, potential energy associated with those interactions, this would then be the particle's total energy. It only has kinetic energy. Now, what's interesting about this, right? 
the right hand side is h bar omega. Now we have not talked a ton about omega yet, but remember that for photons, Einstein in the photoelectric effect says that E equals uh, H nu. Oops. E equals H nu, where nu is the frequency. But we can relate the frequency nu to the angular frequency omega in the following way. Right, so we're uh, well, so I'm sorry, I'm really good. That should be an H, not an H bar. E equals H nu. Um, right, so remember that we can relate the frequency to the angular frequency. Right, nu is uh, omega over 2 pi. Well, if I lump these two things together, that's equivalent to saying E equals h bar omega. So we have this expression for energy that we originally uh, postulated for, for photons, and now we're claiming that this is applying to particles. Well, this isn't like a rigorous proof or anything, but at least this is maybe a plausibility check. We have uh, something that's associated with, with kinetic energy and via momentum, in this left hand side here being associated with what we had said earlier about energy for quanta here on the right side. So again, this isn't a proof, but it suggests two things. It suggests that we're maybe on the right track, and it also suggests that a plane wave uh, for a free particle has a definite energy.